Production support for the weekly special is provided by WTIU members. Thank you. Tonight, the weekly special honors Black History Month. We visit the Southern Indiana Heritage Trail, documenting the sites of Indiana's earliest African-American settlers. A trip to Star Jeanette, the birthplace of recorded jazz. And a glimpse back at what life was like in Bloomington and beyond during the Civil Rights era. Plus, West African drummer Dr. Joe B is here to perform right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Pam Thrash. And I'm Joe Wren. Tonight we've got a show of discovery sharing some of Indiana's rich African American history. That's right. And for some Hoosiers, they've turned the preservation of that history into a lifelong passion. Our first story takes us to the banks of the Ohio to meet the woman behind the Southern Indiana Heritage Trail. I was born here in Cordon, and my ancestors on my father's side, go back to about 1815 that I can document. An elderly couple out of, they were born in Virginia, but they relocated to North Carolina, apparently devoted their entire lives to helping enslaved people get out of slavery into free territory. So that by the time they reached Indiana Territory and Harrison County in particular, they had 100 people, slaves with them. These were slaves who were freed right here in, in Cordon and my great-great-great-grandmother, whose name was Millie, was in that enclave. The fact that that many people would come into a small community like this is just unbelievable because typically when people who were enslaved were getting out of slavery, escaping, you know, fleeing as it were, it was one person, maybe two at most, maybe three but not 100 people. Can you imagine that? It's just hard for me to envision it. But to make that long, long journey because of their commitment to freedom is uh, something very special. I had hoped that the welcome into this territory would have been warm, but I learned, I've learned since then that it wasn't so warm. And I have two letters that were written by townspeople, prominent townspeople, they sent them to the territorial governor complaining and saying, you know, we've heard that these people are coming into our community and, uh, you know, what we're, are we going to do about our daughters and our wives and our corn and, you know, our storehouses and such. So it indicated that they were not welcoming to them, but what could they do about it? This was free territory. The, the Mitchams followed through and gave them all their freedom. So they stayed here and the majority died here, which says something as well. They must have been left alone to some degree or they would not have stayed. They probably would have traveled even farther north. People of color have been in this community since about 1800 and yet it took almost 100 years to get a public school built to accommodate the needs of, that, of those families and those children. So in 1891, the school district let bids. This building was built for about $1,100, and it was an elementary and a secondary school. And the high school was discontinued in 1925 because there weren't enough students to keep it going. By 1950, um, they informed the school district here that the whole school had to be closed because there weren't enough students. My own sister was one of the uh, last students to attend the school. So I had the privilege of purchasing the school and I renamed it for my Aunt Leora because she had graduated from high school here. And then she taught here longer than any other teacher. And she loved this school. She told me that she spent most of her life here and that she just loved it. She loved her profession. And the sad thing is when it was closed, even though she had tenure, she was not retained by the school district and yet she should have been having tenure. So when I purchased the building, I renamed it for her to give her that honor. In doing research on the school and all that surrounded that, that sort of 
piqued my interest in African American history. And I still have so much to learn. It's just amazing how much there is. Just in each county in this state, I think we could come up with volumes of information about that population. What I suggested to my colleagues is that we make the history of African Americans as cohesive as we possibly could, starting with the territorial period. You know, what was it like? Who, who came into Indiana? Who were they and where were they? In southern Indiana, because southern Indiana has the oldest history in the state. Let's try to figure out whether or not it can be done here, and then if it can be, we can extend it throughout the entire state of Indiana. I would love to see the broad public embrace African American history as their history too, because it is. It's all of our history. So, you know, all these stories, unless we pull them up, no one will ever know. And, and there is a curiosity, and I think children are very curious about it. We, we owe it to them to pass along this information. You know, I think that we have set an example here. Hopefully, it, it may take time, because this is the kind of work that doesn't happen overnight. But it, it, I think it will happen if we can just keep our excitement going. I try to get people excited about it, because it is fascinating stuff. Maxine Brown recently won an Eli Lilly Lifetime Achievement Award from the Indiana Historical Society for her continued work. For more information about the trail, visit IndianaAfricanAmericanHeritage.org. And now to Pam with our special guest. That's right, we have West African drummer, Dr. Joe B. <laughs> Dane ame go be do yi dere mi boye grine ko joru kamo da me wo wo yi dere mi boye grine ma zru
Dr. Joe B and crew. Welcome to the weekly special. Thanks for being here. That was fantastic. Tell us a little bit about your background and the band. My name is Dr. Joe B. I come from a small village in Ivory Coast. And my father, my family, they were artists. Six years old, I was already master drummer. And then I love it. That's why I was in Europe, Germany, France, Italy. And then the best country is the United States. I got to be here. <laughs> Aha, away in Bloomington. I spent a little while in New York City, around there, there. Bloomington calling me. And then I love here. Here we have also a teaching classes here, dance, and then drum. I have around me here my student, the high level, Benny Handel, Joshua, and Chris, gentlemen. We are teaching sometime in the school. We need more job. Okay. To, to go in the school, I need it. To teach in the school, the children, all that. And then we have one band, the name Asafo. We play a lot. Marks this place. Marks this place, and then the vein. All the, lo all the local all hangouts the local. in Bloomington, video, <laughs> Max's Place. And if people would like to find out about the classes that you teach, about places you're performing, or anything else about you, website? We're going to the website. Okay. See, Dr. Joby, you guys are going to see that in the screen. Yes, yeah, we, okay. have it, we have it listed here <laughs> for you. And then I want to thank to say, as always, I have a new daughter named Jodu Kamo, what I love a lot because Bloomington gave that to me also. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I say thank you to Harmony Harris working hard for this company, Dr. Yobi Production, I grow up. Okay, and I saw your daughter. She's absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. So we look forward to another song from you all at the end of the show. For now, though, we're going to go back to Joe for a different musical legacy. That's right, Pam. Though only remnants of the Star Jeanette Company remain in Richmond, its impact continues to shape music as we know it. We travel to the cradle of recorded jazz to learn more. Star Piano Company really was one of the, the larger industrial concerns here in Richmond. Richmond was quite an industrial area in the 1800s. Every family had a piano in their parlor because in the days before any kind of mass entertainment that we think of today, all of the daughters, you know, were taught how to play piano so that in the evening the family could sit around the, the piano and sing songs. I mean, that's, that was a very common thing to do. But technology changed, so the Star Piano Company did start producing phonographs because that was sort of the next, you know, right along line with, with the pianos. And then they decided, well, you know, we're, we're putting out these, these beautiful pieces of furniture. Let's make the, the discs that people can play on them as well. So that's when they started thinking about recording music. They opened up a recording studio in Richmond here and uh, started looking around for talent uh, to, to record. America was very segregated, you know, in the 20s. There was considered, you know, good, you know, opera, classical music, and then there was considered common kind of music, blues, jazz, associated with alcohol, associated with speakeasies. It's not some place where parents wanted their kids to go. The teenagers at the time in Chicago and elsewhere uh, uh, just flipped out because this was the new music. This was the new jazz from New Orleans. You know, that was danceable music. You know, this was jazz was kind of an upbeat, kind of a hot kind of music. The Jeanettes took advantage of niches in the market. They didn't see race as a barrier for expanding their business. People of all races and backgrounds uh, came here to Richmond to record. The reason these bands came to little old Richmond, Indiana was because the big companies, you know, Victor and, and Columbia in New York, they were doing classical music. That's, that's what people wanted to hear, and that was the accepted, you know, nobody listened to jazz. I mean, that was like, you know, rock and roll in the 50s. And so only in retrospect 
are these recordings really, really important? At the time, it was just a way to, you know, keep, keep the doors open. There was a group in, in Chicago that was creating a big excitement, and they were the New Orleans Rhythm Kings. And this is the group that Hoagie Carmichael flipped out on, uh, Bix Beiderbeck was singing. So in 1922, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings came down here in an automobile and uh, cut their first songs, like Tin Roof Blues. Within six months, King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band was here. A young cornetist was playing with King Oliver and his name was Louis Armstrong. So we have the first jazz masterpieces were recorded here in Richmond. King Oliver's uh, Creole Jazz Band was just the hit of Chicago. And then after that, it was just kind of an avalanche of, of recording artists that came here to Jeanette. What was sort of unique about Jeanette is that they didn't put a lot of restrictions on the musicians. Um, in, in New York at Columbia Victor, um, they would bring in musicians and they would demand that they, they play certain ways and play certain songs, where Jeanette wanted the musicians to play their best stuff. The stuff that they played on the stage, they played, you know, the weekend before in Chicago. One of the things that's of historical importance here at Jeanette is that Jelly Roll Morton, a marvelous piano player, played with, recorded with, the New Orleans Rhythm Kings right here in Richmond, Indiana. And it's the first documented instance of uh, black and white musicians uh, recorded here, and that, that happened at Jeanette's studio. The numbers of people who came through here are just incredible. There's uh, about 10,000 master recordings that were made. And then from there, they would print uh, many, many records, of course, depending on how the sales were going. Jazz became the popular music. It moved from a regional thing uh, New Orleans thing to a national thing. Jeanette Records, uh, through documenting the recordings of these marvelous musicians, giving them opportunities to record at young ages, not restricting what they could record. You know, a record, you can actually hear what the voice sounded like. You could hear what the cornet or trumpet sounded like or the piano. And uh, you could say, that's Jelly Roll actually playing that star piano or that is Hoagie Carmichael playing Stardust. So you can go back in time and hear that. This is a wonderful history, and uh, the Jeanettes and the stars before them uh, helped, uh, helped it grow. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to document, and uh, it's great American history. For more information on the Star Jeanette Foundation, visit StarJeanette.org. A while ago, the WTIU team released a documentary about Bloomington's own George Taliaferro, the first African-American drafted by the NFL. He spoke with us about his experience playing football during the era of segregation. There was never a level playing field for African Americans in the first half of the 20th century in this country. There was always a field that was tilted uphill in a very, very steep angle for any African American in any endeavor, in any possible occupation, career, or choice. There were always huge odds against achievement, success, participation. Those African Americans who made it, whether in sports or in business or in law or in education, made it through a very large combination of luck and of skill and merit. George experienced racism on the field, off the field. He experienced racism almost everywhere he went because that was, is what was happening in the country at that time. It was absolutely a shock to me to be segregated and discriminated against to the extent that it was in the city of Bloomington. Indiana University Bloomington was very segregated when George came to school there in 1945. There were restaurants he couldn't go into that were on campus. 
He couldn't live on campus. He couldn't go to movie theaters on certain days. And it was frustrating for him because they had wanted him to come and play football for them and had actively recruited him to do so. And then when he comes to IU, he realizes that he's a second-class citizen and he's only allowed in certain places and he can only live in, in certain homes. There were boarding houses for black students, boarding houses for women and for men, people who took in black students in the community, provided them room and board because the dining halls and the residence halls were not open to black students. No black students were allowed to live on campus. All black students lived in the city of Bloomington, the majority on the west side. Black students were not allowed to eat in restaurants in the city of Bloomington. In fact, there was one table reserved for black students in the Union Building on the campus. And whenever we ate at the Commons, that table was reserved for us to eat. African Americans at IU had to go to class and learn and get grades and take exams and all the other sorts of academic things that white students did at Indiana University. Beyond that, beyond that academic experience, their lives changed because they could not participate in so many other aspects of university life. George did encounter some racism when he played for Indiana University on the field. There were teams they played against that just weren't used to playing against, black players. He didn't really let it bother him. He just continued to play football, his brand of football, and use that as his motivation. We had grown up with that type of incident. I know even in high school, you were running into situations where you just had to go out there and do your best. Now, sometimes your best was good enough, sometimes it wasn't, but that's all you had was your best. So you carried that into whatever endeavor you were dealing with. You just went out and do your, did your best. In the late 1940s until the 1970s, and particularly in the 40s and 50s, it was very interesting to be married to an African-American who was playing professional football in the National Football League. It was a, an interesting experience for a number of reasons. George would tell me about lodging, for example. I remember one instance when George was uh, on one of the football teams and they were playing an exhibition game in Houston, Texas. And George and at least one or two other black athletes who were members of the same team were not able to live in that hotel. But they had to go to that hotel for the meetings and they were taken to the rooms where the meetings were held in the service elevator. He also told me about uh, one particular instance when they were in Little Rock, Arkansas, and they had a depot there that had colored on one side and white on the other, and George and Buddy Young were on the, what they called, colored side, and when some of the white players came over to talk with them, Buddy Young asked them to please go back over to the white side. Uh, they sort of laughed about it, but it was really not funny. I was angry and frustrated and could not understand how George could continue to perform in that atmosphere. We do counter racism when we went to another southern town, and we also encouraged racism even in closest Baltimore, because we'd have to come down the day, after, the day of the game in the morning, catch the train, and they would meet us at the train and take us directly to the stadium. And that's how we go. Many, many white Americans like to think that there is no issue of race in our country anymore, that we've solved that problem, that it doesn't exist, that the playing field is level. I don't see it that way as a historian or as a citizen. I see restrictions, I see limitations, I see, I see challenges that make for many African Americans a far more difficult situation than for most white Americans from the moment of birth until the day of death. He wanted to play football, I think, all of his life, even before he knew it, he probably wanted to play. And he wanted to overcome racism. He went to an all-black school. They didn't have football uniforms. They didn't have the stadium. He couldn't understand those things. So he wanted to demonstrate 
that despite the differences in physical equipment, that he could achieve. But he wasn't just doing that for himself. He was doing that for his friends, his family, for the entire race. That's what motivated him. He wanted to succeed in a country that told him he should be able to. If you'd like to learn more about George Taliaferro's story, visit the WTIU online store to purchase the complete documentary DVD. That's it for tonight's show. Join us next time on the weekly special. For now, we leave you with more from Beats from Dr. Joe B. Production support for the weekly special is provided by WTIU members. Thank you.